Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Two Guys in the Bible, and this is William Bell. I am checking to see if Don Preston is available today. I see that he has definitely called in, or at least I believe, yeah, that's his number. And um, so I'm waiting to see if I can get um, some response from him. So it looked like a little bit of um, just technical difficulty with his phone at the moment. Don, if you are able to hear me, why don't you go ahead and speak up and say something. Let's see if we can hear you on this end. Okay, because it's showing that you're live, and uh, but I'm not able to hear you at the moment. So what you might want to do, let, let's see if I can, um, let's see if this helps. And then if it doesn't, then I might have to have you call back in to um, see if we can get you connected. See what happens here. Nope, that doesn't work either. Uh, there's a question mark by your um, <laughs> by your number, but it will not allow me to click on the question mark to find out what question they either have with your number or you have <laughs> with your number. At any rate, we are um, we're waiting for uh, Don to come on. I know he's been struggling with some illness, uh, particularly with his um, uh, throat and uh, congestion and uh, various things of that nature. So uh, he probably can, is going can to wait. No, I can, can you hear me? you. There you go. You're coming oh, in. There okay. you go. I good, uh, good. I have I have a different set of earphones on William, and they've got a button a mute button on the side, which I had evidently <laughs> inadvertently <laughs> hit and muted my my mic, and I did not realize that. I just kind of, I thought, oh, wait a minute, let's try this. <laughs> okay. So my my apologies about that. Oh, that's okay. We're glad that you're here. You sound good. Sound like your voice is strong. And um, But we're going to get started right away. I'm actually still doing a little bit of um, promotion here as we go along. Um, so what's been going on? I know you've been recovering from illness, so are you doing better? Are you feeling better? I actually woke up this morning feeling better than I have in over two weeks. It was, it was, uh, I'm not going to say the fog was completely lifted. I'm not going to say my voice was completely clear. It mm-hmm. took me about three tries this morning in my filming of my YouTubes, you know, I'd, I'd get rolling there a little bit and all of a sudden I'd start coughing and hacking and what have you. And, uh, so I just clear my throat, try again, and it would happen again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've still got a little bit of an issue with coughing, but, um, uh, I'm very, very thankful that today has been my very, very best day for about two weeks. And it's couldn't come at a better time since I will be heading Lord willing, I'll be headed to Salt Lake City on Thursday, and then on Friday and Saturday, I will be speaking out there on the theme, Are We in the Last Days? And then on Saturday evening, I will be having a formal public debate with uh, Mr. Jason Wallace, who is a self-described Orthodox, Reformed, Amillennialist. And so uh, he sees himself as the person who according to our private correspondence, he says that he sees this debate as the perfect opportunity to expose the error of the full preterist paradigm. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the real trouble of this debate, and one that we tried to negotiate, but he just simply wouldn't do much, is that the debate is going to be of such short duration I mean, it's just 
I mean, you know me, William, I can barely say hello in 25 words or less. And so um, when, when he laid out the format, I was just sitting there going, no, 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 no. Uh, that's just simply not enough time. I still don't think it's enough time. Uh, for the simple fact of the matter that someone who is defending and stating a traditional view in front of a traditional audience, really and essentially, as you and I have talked before, all they have to do is get up and say, this is what I believe, this is the truth. Mr. Preston over there is a heretic, he's a false teacher. And the crowd goes, well, amen to that. And to attempt to present an unorthodox view in a really short period of time is just extremely, extremely difficult. And the more the the most time that I could get him to increase the amount of time allotted for the debate was a total of ten minutes. And I'm not very happy at all with that. But it's the only way that we could get the debate to take place. And so I went ahead and agreed to it. We will uh we will see how it goes. I I still think that uh in my allotted time, especially in my affirmative, I can present some material that will be sufficient for thinking people that uh, will cause their head to spin, so to speak. So uh, I, I'm very, very much looking forward to it. Yeah. Now, you said the total time for the discussion is how much? Oh, no, no, no. No, I was saying that uh, even after several exchanges via email, uh, with me just almost begging for more time for the debate, the most that I could get him to increase the amount of time was an additional 10 minutes uh, in addition to the time that he had initially suggested. And I, I just kept telling him, it's, it's insufficient, it's not proper, it's not enough time for a, a legitimate debate. And, you know, essentially he was saying, oh, yeah, it's plenty of time, plenty of time. Well, from his position, simply getting up and asserting a traditional view, yeah, it it's, sounds like plenty of time. But, again, to try to present new ideas and sufficient data and sufficient evidence in such a short period of time in order to get people to rethink is extremely difficult. And, of course, that's what he's counting on. But, again, I'm going to do my best to give enough information in my allotted time that is going to be sufficiently clear, explicit, and emphatic that hopefully some people will go, Wow. Okay. Going to have to think about that. We'll see. Yeah. Well, the one thing you got going for you is you can speak a little rapidly when necessary. Uh, <laughs> people complained about that in my debate that I had uh, just recently. They said, well, he talked too fast. But, you know, we have things to say. We have things to to do. We didn't, right. come there to play, <laughs> we didn't come there to play around. You know, we, we have things to, to get across. And while everybody else is, you know, fumbling and fiddling, trying to figure out what they're going to say and where they're going to find it in the Bible, you know, we're we're on with the business. So I know that's how that's you're going to be in the yeah, uh, in they, the discussions. Go they, ahead. they don't call me motor mouth for nothing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And then they can always slow us down later, right? Rewind us. And, oh, and that's uh, exactly just... right. That, that that's <laughs> my whole point. Uh, it's going to be on YouTube, Lord willing. He has already stated that he's going to post it on YouTube immediately. Sean McCraney, who is the host of the entire event, is going to post it on YouTube. I will have to get Sean to tell me how to post such a lengthy uh, event on YouTube because, it, that, to me, that would just take forever and a day to, to upload. Uh, and maybe they know of a different way to do it that, that is more efficient than I, than I know how to do. But anyway, it will be on YouTube on Jason's, uh, Jason's website or I should say YouTube channel, which is The Ancient Past, and it will be on Sean McCraney's site, which is the um, uh, the heart of the matter. And to reiterate, Lord willing, if they can show me how to do it, give me the instructions to where I can upload it relatively quickly, it will be on my YouTube as well. Because we want people to have the information. All right. Well, very good, very good. Well, I've had some a um, little bit of a problem myself, but you know it's doing much better now. Uh, I had a little problem with that carpal tunnel or whatever you call it, uh, whatever oh, problem my. you get when you have that ligament or something damaged on your thumb, 
And yep. uh, man, was it painful for a couple of days? I couldn't button my shirt yesterday <laughs> on the way to <laughs> you know uh, getting ready for service, or, or rather Sunday. And uh, but you know, last night uh, this was like the second day. Um, man, it felt so much better, and uh, it's just gotten better as the day has uh, gone on. And uh, man, am I thankful for that because I tell you, it's no oh. fun. Feeling that pain. I heard people, you know, I worked at FedEx for years, um, started back in when? Woo, it's been a long time ago. (laughs) (laughs) But at any rate, um, you know, it's been almost 30 years, you know, at least 20 some years when I started work at FedEx. But um, I used to hear people, you know, talk about that all the time. And I, you know, because everything there was done on computers for the most part. And so you'd see people walking around with these these little uh, casts on their hands and, uh, you know, splints or whatever you call them. And I just thought, I mean, you know, they're typing. I'm wondering, you know, what what can be the issue. But, you know, I've been working on a book, and um, I I spent some late nights and early mornings, you know, working through the night to finish it up. And uh, and I think after I put that last weekend where I just really just plowed through it, after I finished, that's what I ended up with. <laughs> so yeah. I'm grateful that it's doing much better. You know, I know people say, oh, it's just this thumb. But let me tell you something. When you, when you hurt that thumb and it hurts like that, man, I, I had no <laughs> idea it could be that painful. And it's and it's also, you know, it's just uh, discomforting and um, inconvenient when you can't Absolutely. use this part of your hand to do the normal things that you do. And that just lets you know how how much every part of your body is valuable to you because this, you don't realize connected to that bone. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm grateful. And you probably heard me in the background. I was typing away just then, just getting my last little, little message out while we were uh, getting uh, ready to, uh, you know, go through the lesson, but just wanted yeah. to make sure that I got all of the uh, avenues on all of our little uh, web pages on Facebook, which we have a few uh, to get the, um, get the links out there so people can reach us and um, access it from any page that they might be familiar with because some of them, yep. you know, follow one page or the other. Well, today um, we are going to continue our critique of Mr. Jerry Brewer, who delivered a lecture on the nature of prophecy, or should we call it the nature of promise? I'm not sure, Don. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since he seemed to have... A problem uh, with the distinction between the promise and prophecy, uh, and and um, I really thought that was an interesting paradigm that he wanted to to enter uh, to try to get around the uh, end time fulfillment in the in the first century, uh, and also you know even the debate that you're going to have you know are we still living in the last days um, or are we in the last days? You know it's amazing that we still are answering that question for people, but it's, it is just, this is something that people just are not aware of. They do not know. And so it's important to answer that question, but we're going to be looking at um, his views on the nature of prophecy and uh, whether or not it, you know, a promise, the second coming was a promise or a prophecy. And what difference does it make? <laughs> if it's already oh, oh my goodness. I, <laughs> you know, William, when I, when I heard him say that, and, and we want to get to that later in the program a little more substantively, but yeah. when I heard him introduce the concept that one of the things that Max King does not understand and his, and his <clears throat> followers don't understand is the distinction between prophecy and promise. And I literally sit there going, uh, well, <clears throat> you're right, I do. <laughs> Oh, here we go. All right. Yeah, get you some uh, water. Do you have water yeah, handy? Yeah, I've got some water handy right here. Let me uh, let me take a little quick sip and uh, get this out of. But when he said that, I was literally going, well, you're right. I don't know the distinction between prophecy and, pro- and promise uh, in regard to the eschatological elements. So maybe you can explain this to me. And when when he went over the so-called distinction, and again we'll get to this more as the program proceeds. But when the when he made his so-called distinctions, I was like, these guys are coming up with some of the most disingenuous, may I say, sh- sh- shallow and silly 
arguments that I have ever heard in my life. It, it's really an embarrassment toward scholarship. It's an insult to scholarship. For someone to attempt to delineate between prophecy and promise is not a prophecy God's promise that something was going to take place? And was not God promising that something would take place, a prophecy of what would take place? I just, <laughs> you know, <coughs> it's you just know, it's, uh, it's amazing. One of the most uh, just ridiculous, you know, as they say, a distinction without a difference. <laughs> it's it's just absolutely uh, mind-boggling how they try to split hairs in order to uh, circumvent the simple teachings of Scripture. You know, the point being, uh, when does he say the promise was going to be fulfilled? When did he say the prophecy was going to be fulfilled? So either way you slice that, you know, that cake, it's going to end up being the same thing. Um, the issue exactly. is not what the nature of it is. Uh, and as you just pointed out, there is no difference between a promise and a prophecy. A prophecy is a promise of God. And uh, and a promise is it, you know it's nothing but a, a a prophecy from from you know one perspective. And I know he went back and got Four Wallace's definition of what prophecy was, et cetera. But I can assure you that when you look at that, you will understand even from Wallace's writings in all of his books that the second coming was a prophecy. Uh, Absolutely, so, and we'll we'll prove we'll prove that from Scripture later in the show. But you know, right now, uh, Mr. Brewer spent an awful long time down toward the close of his presentation on Matthew chapter 24, making mm -hmm. some arguments about the Olivet Discourse, which are pretty much traditional arguments, but it's kind of like you were saying there, William, about the, the concept of the last day. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes you sit and we, we become so used to understanding <clears throat> and communicating the idea that we're not in the last days that we almost forget at times that the vast majority of people that we communicate with do not yet understand this fundamental fact. If they understood that we are not in the last days, if they understood that the last days were in the first century, they, their entire eschatological paradigm would of necessity undergo radical transformation. Every single religion, American religion, that was established, for instance, in the 1900s, the Seventh-day Adventist, <clears throat> <clears throat> pardon me, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and who else, but those three major American religions were all founded upon the idea that they were living in the very last days. William Miller predicted the coming of the Lord in 1844. Rutherford and his followers, the Millennial Dawn uh, people, as they were originally known, they said the end was coming very, very soon. Now, into the early 19th century, or 20th century, excuse me. And I have, I have a copy of the book in my library entitled Millions Now Living Will Never Die. A very, very rare book. By I used to have Donald a copy Society. of it. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I have a copy. Do. I'm not sure. I might still have mine. Yeah. Well, that, that book disappears from the used bookstores if a Jehovah's Witness sees it because they don't want those books out there. But the entire premise was they were the last generation. And, of course, the Mormons, the Church of Jesus Christ of, quote, latter-day saints. Joseph Smith believed and taught they were living in the last days. And, of course, he predicted, he made a prediction in 1832 that the end was coming very, very soon. The world was, would end in his generation. There you have three major religions based upon the basic fundamental premise that they were living in the last days in the 18th century. And we are living in times today in which John Hagee says, hey, fourth blood moon, 
the end of September 2015. It's going to all be wrapped up. Jonathan Kahn, with his predictions of the uh, Shemitah, Shemitah, and the impending, for sure, catastrophic collapse of the American economy no later than September the 29th. And on and on it goes, folks, because the underlying view is we are in the last days. So what you said there is an understatement, and Jerry Brewer believes that we're in the last days, not in the same sense as these religions that we have mentioned. But he believes the last days is a reference to the entirety of the Christian age. So when he comes to Matthew 24, and the disciples begin to show Jesus the magnificent stones of the temple, and Jesus said, do you not see all of these things? The time is coming in which not one stone shall be left standing on top of another. And the disciples immediately responded, tell us, <clears throat> when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming in the end of the world? William, I couldn't help but shake my head when Jerry Brewer just read it. They were asking about the end of the world. I just sat there and I listened to it and I thought, that is so poor, that is so shallow, that is so uninformed as to be embarrassing. Did I misconstrue his words? I don't remember exactly what his words were. I, I listened to him a little bit um, before coming on, but, I mean, if he's... Um, you know, if he's saying that, I don't think you misconstrued it at all in terms of, um, you know, what. Yeah, he, uh, he, <clears throat> yeah, I apologize there. But, yeah, he never, ever, not once referred to the Greek of the text to say that they were a actually asking about the end of the age, not the, not the end of the world. That wasn't the focus. They were asking about the end of the age. And, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, William, he made the comment. I want you to comment on this. Mm -hmm. The apostles wrongly assumed that the end of the world was tied to the destruction of the temple, unquote. Yeah, well, that is one of the fallacies that is made, and uh, particularly because of their interpretation of Matthew 24, 3 as being the end of the world. Uh, many of them don't look in the Greek to see that what he's saying there is um, when will the consum of the consummation of the age occur. That is a part of the question. And, of course, the age in which they lived was the Jewish age. There is no question about that. There is no doubt about that. Jesus hadn't died. He could not have been living in the Christian age. So it would have to have been the last days of the of the Jewish age. But because they look at the term world and assume that it is uh, a, you know, the physical universe, then that is typically what they view that to be, because they associate with that uh, the coming of the Lord. Now, some of them, of course, make a distinction between that and the, um, and the destruction of the temple, but others don't. And so you have this dichotomy and this division between them in terms of, how they even apply it. But generally, uh, they will take the word end of the world to mean the end of the uh, the universe. And, of course, um, as we get later on in the discussion, I'm sure that will come out uh, in the later verses of Matthew 24. Yeah, well, William, answer this question. <clears throat> how do we know? How would we know? I mean, he makes a really bold statement. Now, believe me, I understand exactly where he's coming from. I once argued exactly like he's arguing here. You probably did as well. <clears throat> but he says the apostles wrongly assumed that the end of the world was tied to the destruction of the temple. He is saying, as 99% of the commentators that you pick up will agree and say, those disciples were confused. They, they were simply wrong. 
they were confused to link the end of the world with the fall of Jerusalem. Everyone knows they were wrong. How, how would you respond to the claim that the disciples were so confused in their questions? Well, you know, first, and, and this would be something that really should cause them to take a step back and really think about that premise. I know how solid and firm they are on the teaching about the Spirit leading and guiding the apostles in all truth, from John 16, 13, 14, etc. And so if you have the apostles being mistaken about something as significant as the end of the world, so as to misalign it with the destruction of Jerusalem, according to them, then they're saying that the apostles were uninspired or that there were fallacies in the inspired word they received from the Holy Spirit. Now, that creates a ton of problems and challenges for a person that's really seeking to understand the Word of God and place their faith in the Word of God. And this is not um, something that is unique to them. There have been others who have basically said the same thing. Well, not basically. They have emphatically stated the same thing. But in other words, to say that, you know, the end of the world is separate and apart from the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, yeah, from the destruction of the temple and that um, the apostles are mistaken. Well, who's teaching them? Christ is teaching them. And um, if he's teaching them and answering the questions, then we would have to reflect that back on him just as we would on the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, it boils down to uh, calling God a liar. That's that's in essence what it is. And uh, actually, all of the statements that we find later on in the epistles, all the way through to the book of Revelation, which uh, many of them will ascribe to the destruction of Jerusalem, to the overthrow of the temple, uh, they would have some problems with that as well. But that's the biggest issue I would see done at this point, um, and that is them simply attributing the apostles to writing false teaching, to teaching uh, false doctrine, and being comfortable with it, number one. Now, here they are. <laughs> they will get up, and they will read, as he did. He read Second Timothy 2 to speak about you and Max. And then he will get up and charge the apostles with teaching a falsehood and then feel extremely comfortable about saying it. it wouldn't that be claiming inspiration to be able to oh, say the apostles were right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and that is the other amazing thing about it is that, you know, they feel that they can charge the apostles with error rather than charge themselves with it. Well, this is something that the more I have studied down through the years. But I'm going to play the devil's advocate here, William. I'm going to play the devil's advocate really strong here. I want you to answer this now. I'm going to put you on the spot. So, okay, William, you're saying that it was not possible for the disciples to be confused or the disciples just simply to have misunderstood what Jesus said. But hang on now, because we know without a doubt from John 6, John 14, and other passages as well, there were numerous occasions during Jesus' ministry in which Jesus would say something, and the disciples were just a, dumb as a box of rocks. They were very clearly confused. So what is there to tell us they weren't just as confused in Matthew 24 as they were in John 6 when Jesus said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and the disciples did not understand what he was saying. They thought he was talking about literal bread. So <laughs> well, we know we know they were confused over here. Why not in Matthew 24? Well, you know, it is true that on some occasions they did say that um, they uh, were confused and um, they didn't understand certain things. But I, I'm looking for the text, and, in, I, and I know exactly what you're asking the Lord actually asked them on an occasion after he taught them this, do you understand? And they said, yes, Lord. Um, it is, yes. It is Matthew chapter 13. There you go. And, I thought it was in the parable. of. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. In Matthew 13, folks, you, you really honestly just have to catch the power of this, okay? 
Matthew 24, verse 3, what should be the sign of your coming, the end of the age, they, they ask Jesus, and they use a really distinctive Greek term, suntalia ton aonion, or uh, suntalia aonio, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, just, yeah, I just lost it right there in the midstream. Anyway, very, very distinctive Greek term. It's only used about seven or eight times in the entirety of the New Testament, but it literally means conservation of the age. Well, over here, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells the parable. And in Matthew 13, 39, and 40, Jesus says, so it shall be at the end of the age, and he uses this exact same precise, very distinctive Greek term, suntalia ton aeonion. That, I'll just pronounce it that way. It's easier for me to remember. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> then Jesus tells two more parables and says, so shall it be at the end of the age, using the identical distinctive Greek term. By the way, that distinctive Greek term is used more in Matthew 13 than it's used in any other text. So Matthew 13 is going to be the source for our understanding of this very, very distinctive Greek term, very limited in its usage. Okay. Jesus tells them about the end of the age three times in Matthew 13. Well, in Matthew 13, when he says, so shall it be at the, at the end of this age, the Son of Man will send forth his angels. They shall gather, the, gather together the wheat into the barn. They shall cast the tares into the fire. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, which is a direct echo of Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. So Jesus is talking about the end of the age. The end of the age would be when Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 would be fulfilled. Daniel chapter 12, verse 7 says that end of the age, which is the time of the resurrection, verse 2, would be when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. So here is Jesus. And by the way, a, a slightly different form of that Greek term is found in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 and verse 4 in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the old uh, Hebrew covenant, covenant, of course. So you have Daniel referring to this distinctive end of the age. Jesus says the end of the age that Daniel predicted is what he was talking about. But Daniel said the end of the age would be when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Then in Matthew chapter 13, 50 and 51, after telling them about the end of the age, referring directly to Daniel, Daniel having foretold that it would be fulfilled at the dis power destruction of the power of the holy people, Jesus asked the disciples, do you understand? And they said, yes. So William, it seems to me, we have an incredible, incredible problem on our hands. When we go to Matthew 13, Jesus talks about the end of the age, the same exact identical Greek term as in Matthew 24, 3. He tells the disciples about it, quotes or cites Daniel chapter 12, which had foretold that when it would be fulfilled. They know the Old Covenant Scriptures, every minute detail, but Daniel 12, verse 7 is pretty explicit. And they affirm that they understand it. But now, when Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, uh, 24 is talking about the destruction of the temple, which is the very symbol, the very symbol of Israel's power with Yahweh, and they ask him when, we're supposed to believe they're thinking about something totally radically different from what they understood Jesus to be saying in Matthew 13. I mean, did they just go brain dead between Matthew 13 and Matthew 24? We're talking about the same end of the age, after all. The end of the age that Daniel foretold would occur when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. And here's Jesus talking about the shattering of the holy people, i.e., the old temple which stood for the old covenant, and they don't get it. They, they don't understand it anymore. They're confused. I, I just have a really difficult time with that, William. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, it shows very clearly that they understood and uh, they would not have uh, misunderstood from the time between that and Matthew 20, 24, particularly on the same subject. And as a matter of fact, you could 
say that that's the reason why they connected them together, because they had been taught and they understood it. And, and Jesus goes ahead to say in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, let the one who reads let him understand. Well, Daniel chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, spoke of the abomination of desolation. And here he is speaking to those disciples about the time of the abomination of desolation, which is taken from Daniel chapter 12, which he had already alluded to and echoed and cited in Matthew 13, asking them, do you understand? They said yes, but now, once again, we're supposed to believe that they have completely and totally forgot what they understood in Matthew chapter 13. You know, folks, I, I've made this comment before in some of my books and in different presentations. It's rather disingenuous, so far as I'm concerned, for modern-day commentators to take it for granted that those disciples were so totally ignorant, number one of the Old Covenant prophets and the prophecies <clears throat> that foretold the destruction of Jerusalem and Israel in the last days. They're ignorant of that. They're ignorant specifically of Daniel 12, which foretold the end of the age when Israel's power would be shattered. Ignorant, completely, totally, absolutely ignorant of the relationship between the fall of Jerusalem, the symbol of God's covenant with Israel, and the connection between Matthew 13 that they said they understood. To me, William, that is kind of an arrogance that we today know more than the disciples did. We today cannot be wrong in our assessment. And yet here's something abundantly strange to me, William. When I read the scholarly works on Daniel, and more specifically, when I read the scholarly works on the resurrection of the dead, I read men such, such as N.T. Wright. And he tells us that Daniel chapter 12 clearest Old Testament prophecy, the resurrection of the dead. And N.T. Wright says not one single word in his massive book, The Resurrection of the Son of Man. Not one single word about Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. And ver a commentator after commentator after commentator completely and totally ignore Daniel 12, verse 7, and its relationship to verse 2. All the while affirming, guess what? Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, is the resurrection at the end of the Christian age. And so when we, when we come to passages like Matthew chapter 24, which are a prediction of the destruction of Israel's covenant power, which is the only power Israel ever possessed. And then we completely divorce it from Matthew 13 and Jesus' just description of the end of the age taken from Daniel chapter 12. But we act as if, modern commentators I should say, act as if Daniel 12 is not related to Matthew 13, even though here, interestingly enough, a, a huge number of commentators see very clearly that Matthew 13, 43 is, in fact, a citation of Daniel 12, verse 30. But they don't draw the connection with verse 7. Never draw the connection. So we have a dichotomy being created in the modern commentators, even the very best of the scholarly commentators, between Daniel 12 <clears throat> Matthew 13, well, they may give lip service to it, but they, they do not explore it. And then they most assuredly draw a distinction between Matthew 13 and Matthew 24 and the correlation with Daniel chapter 12. And it, it's like, wait a minute, guys. Daniel very clearly lies behind Matthew chapter 24. After all, Jesus cites and alludes to Daniel chapter 12 repeatedly either by the motifs that he mentions or by specifically saying, uh, when the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stands in the holy place, well, hello, if that's not a direct pointer 
to Daniel 9 and Daniel 12, I mean, how much clearer could it get? And yet the commentators ignore Daniel 12, verse 7. When they try to interpret Matthew 13, and when they try to interpret, guess what? Matthew chapter 24. It's just absolutely amazing. Well, that's excellent. It totally refutes the idea that there is a distinction between the destruction of the temple and the end of the world, as well as any notion that the apostles were ill-informed. And as you say, to claim that we know more than they did. Men who walked around with Christ, men who uh, he opened their hearts and minds to understand the scriptures, and then gave them the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Why would they, and we know that the epistles and the letters were written after they received the Holy Spirit. So if they were under the impression, under mistaken notions when they were with Christ in his ministry, why would, after being corrected by the Holy Spirit, Don, would they write the falsehood that they were earlier laboring under if that were the case? That doesn't make sense. We don't even do that. (laughs) <laughs> no, absolutely not, and it's a fantastic point. And, <clears throat> pardon me. And let's go back to the fact of something that I mentioned when I was playing the devil's advocate there a few moments ago, and that is this. Okay, there is no doubt whatsoever that on many occasions in Jesus' ministry, there is no question whatsoever that the disciples simply did not understand. I mean, John 14 is a classic example when Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Thomas, not Iscariot, uh, or Judas, excuse me, not Iscariot, says, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice. And Jesus, you know, you can almost see Jesus doing a face palm. Like, oh, good grief. Oh, good grief. Have I been so long with you, but you do not understand. Now, here's the point that I would like to make. In every instance in which we know that the disciples were confused, that they had the wrong idea. How do we know they were confused? How do we know they didn't have the proper idea? The reason we know, and by the way, there are more occurrences of this, uh, quote, confusion in the book of John uh, as a whole than there are in any of the other Gospels. But how do we know that they were confused on those occasions? It's because, for instance, John, writing after the fact, as William has so well pointed out, and after receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit for inspiration, John reminisced on what happened on that occasion, what was said on that occasion, and you can just imagine John himself going, you know, guys, we were a bunch of dummies. <laughs> we, we just didn't get what he was saying. We did not understand. And, and you know, to me, William, that's part of the, uh, what's the word, the, the, the total objectivity of the, of the Gospels. I mean, If John and the rest of the New Testament uh, gospel writers were writing what we would call, or what used to be called, panegyric histories, that is, you you just build yourself up to make yourself look great, you leave out all the bad stuff, you don't ever include any of the bad stuff, Right? would John have said, would John have ever admitted, because after all, he's one of them on the boat, when Jesus said, beware the Pharisees, and they begin to talk among themselves, what's he talking about? Uh, is, is, is he, do, the, do, do the Pharisees have some leaven that that's poison? Oh, what's going on here? And Jesus once again goes, guys, do you do you just not understand? I'm talking about the doctrine. And then face palm. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know very good and well. John, as a human being, would never have included that record of his own ignorance if he would have been writing that kind of a history. But he was being brutally honest. But the question is, where is that kind of a statement in Matthew 24? 
when the disciples say, okay, Lord, uh, <clears throat> tell us, uh, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when, when you come uh, physically and bodily out of heaven on a cloud at the end of the material cosmos? Because we, we, are, we know, we believe that, th- that that's going to happen at the fall of Jerusalem. And where does Jesus go, guys, have I been so long with you that you don't understand yet? Or where did Matthew or Mark or Luke, writing in retrospect, say they did not understand that he spoke to them about the fall of Jerusalem as well as the end of time? You see... We don't have any of those retrospective clarifications and explanations of the apostles' ignorance or confusion or error. That claim of the apostles' confusion or error has to be read into the text. There are no words there to indicate they were confused. There are no words there to indicate that they were in error. And, you know, William, I keep asking a really, really simple, but to me very profound question. Okay, so the disciples connected the coming of the Lord and the end of the age with the fall of Jerusalem. What age did the what age did that temple represent? Did it represent the Christian age? <laughs> well, that's kind of silly, isn't it? No way, right. no shape, no, absolutely no connection between that temple and the Christian age. So why would the disciples be so ignorant, so confused, so misguided, as, con- as to connect Jesus' prediction of the destruction of the temple with the end of the Christian age. I mean, William, where would they ever get that idea? Impossible for me to understand how they would get it. I mean, that's like like us trying to talk about some age that is beyond the one in which we live, for which we have no, you know, no information or no point of reference for it to base anything that we currently have on it. Uh, aside from, you know, speculation. So uh, it's just really a contrived notion on their part. I think it demonstrates uh, how much of a failure uh, they have in trying to uh, really teach the truth on this topic. They have, you know, they understand that they're in a corner. Um, They have no answers. And so now they start trying to lay blame on somebody for the reason for their confusion. So let's put it on the apostles. Let's call the people who teach it false, and let's say the apostles were mistaken for even giving the notion that it could be true. Just just ridiculous. Okay, William, well, let's move on because we're running out of time this evening, and I don't think we want to spend another uh, another program on Mr. Brewer's presentation because he just has so much ridiculous th- so many ridiculous things to say. Okay, let, let's look at his statement that we began uh, and gave a few cursory remarks about at the be- beginning of the program, William. King and his disciples do not know the difference between a prophecy and a promise. The second coming, listen folks, th- this, this is directly from Mr. Jerry Brewer's presentation given at the Bellevue Church Christ Lectures a couple of months ago. King and his disciples do not know the difference between a prophecy and a promise. The second coming is not a prophecy. It is a promise since it is based on his first coming. A prophecy has no prior event related to it. A promise does. I I just, my goodness gracious, folks, these men in their attempts to refute covenant eschatology, are making some of the most unscholarly, uncritical, illogical, facile arguments that are possibly imaginable. Let's just see 
if that's true. Now, a prophecy, remember, a prophecy has no prior event related to it. A prophecy basically comes out of nowhere. It's not based upon anything that has taken place at all, according to Jerry Brewer, and he tried to substantiate that from Foy Wallace. I'm not real sure that Foy Wallace would completely concur with the way that he was trying to use this, but be that as it may, all right, I want you to notice something, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus, in his parables, was asked by the disciples, why, why do you teach them? That is, why do you teach the audience? In parables. And Jesus responded. Now, this is Matthew chapter 13, verse 14. Now, remember, according to Mr. Brewer, a prophecy has no precedent. A prophecy is not based upon any prior event or events. A prophecy is a standalone un, uh, proclamation of what shall be not based upon anything that has been. Well, let's see. So the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak to them in parables? Verse 13, Matthew 13, 13. I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which he says, hearing you will hear, shall not understand, seeing you will see, not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, turn, so that I should heal them. William, where's that from? That's in Matthew 13. Oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying that in them oh, it might be... Oh, it's be in for... Isaiah. You mean where is it originally? Yeah. It's in yes. Isaiah. It's a prophecy. In Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. Now, wait a minute. Jesus said that the response of the audience of his day would be the fulfillment of, pardon me, of the prophecy of Isaiah 6. But wait, I, William, wasn't the prophecy of Isaiah 6 speaking initially of Isaiah's day? Absolutely. Okay, then definitely. Mr. Brewers, go ahead. No, I was just saying that's definitely the case. And, uh, okay. Which, go ahead, because I know what you're about to say. Yeah, so Mr. Brewer's claim that a prophecy just basically comes out of nowhere, has no precedental uh, events or actions or statements uh, from which it rises. But here's Jesus saying that what happened in Isaiah's day, in Isaiah's ministry, that is Israel closing her eyes, closing her ears, closing their hearts, was actually a prophecy of Jesus' generation. So we have the precedent of Israel in Isaiah's day serving as a prophecy of what would happen in Jesus' day. Mr. Brewer's claim that a prophecy has no, I'm quoting now, a prophecy has no prior event related to it, unquote, is patently false. By the way, William, in Revelation chapter 22, uh, question, first of all, William, does is the book of Revelation about the coming of Christ? Absolutely. <laughs> Interesting. Trick question. You know? <laughs> it's not a, not a trick question. <laughs> no, no, no. I know it's not a trick question. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, the person that he depended so heavily on to get his definitions from, which was Foy Wallace, which you and I are familiar with, also took the book of Revelation as a prophecy, but he applied it to the destruction of Jerusalem. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and yet here they are taking it as a prophecy and applying it as a future 
coming of the Lord. But yeah, three times in the book, it talks about the prophecy of this book, and it uses it in the singular. So it's not a book of prophecies. It is the book of prophecy or the book of this prophecy. So that's right. That is, uh, you know, the point that's being made in the book of Revelation. But yes, go ahead. Yeah, it seems to me, William, uh, if Mr. Brewer's dichotomization between prophecy and promise were true, that as John went through the book of Revelation, when he was talking about things that had a precedent standing behind them, i.e., uh, therefore making something a promise that he was going to write about, uh, <clears throat> versus a prophecy, which would be a brand new thing having no uh, no event in prior history as a precedent, Shouldn't John have gone through the book and said, now, now I'm going to make a promise here, and, and it, it's based upon something prior that's happened, but now let me make a prophecy, and, and you've never heard of what I'm about to prophesy about right here. He should have said, now, uh, concerning here in chapter 22, by the way, should John not have said, he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy and the promises of this book for the time is at hand, should he not have said, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life, may enter into the gates of the city, and then gave the warning in verse 18, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to these things, or add, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, singular, the point William was just making, uh, of this prophecy and promises, God shall take away his part from the book of life, either prophecies or promises. But you see, he didn't do any of this. This is an absolutely false distinction that Mr. Brewer was making. It just falls flat on its face. It is a contrived, invented <clears throat> argument that has no merit whatsoever. It's 657. I did not give you fair warning of this, but I'm actually due to do another program, a radio program on Skype as in now. So <laughs> with that, I'm going <laughs> uh, sorry I didn't give you any heads up on that, but uh, let me say good night and God bless to our audience and say how much we appreciate everyone tuning in. I will let you go ahead and summarize while I log off and go ahead and pick up with the other program that I'm supposed to do. So good night and God bless from Don Preston. All right, Don. We'll see you later. Thanks a lot for your uh, comments on tonight. And we only have about 90 seconds to go. So ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, I'm not going to uh, go into anything new. Of course, we, you know, we've talked about uh, Mr. Brewer's comments tonight that there was a difference between prophecy and promise, and uh, we've demonstrated that there is no such difference in the Bible between the prophecy and the promise. They're, they are the same. Uh, we were just discussing Revelation chapter 22, uh, and uh, where he talked about the prophecy, and it's in the singular. And one of the things that's so interesting is that the book of Revelation speaks of both the destruction of Jerusalem uh, as an event in uh, Revelation 11, as well as the um, what he would call the coming of the Lord and the end of heaven and earth, all of those things which are found in Matthew chapter 24, and yet it describes them all as prophecy. Uh, to say that the apostles were confused or misinformed in uh, Matthew 24 on the uh, in ascribing the end of the world in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem, which a lot of people think um, is two separate, or yeah, is two separate events. Um, people are still confused about that. They do not see the end of the world, which was actually the consummation of the age in Matthew twenty four three, because they read either King James version of the Bible, they don't do the research and understand that it was the consummation of the age. Uh, that he was talking about the end of the Jewish age, they fall into these misconceptions about the end of the uh, physical world, and that just is not the case. They were talking about the end of the Jewish age tied to the temple, and that is the event to which Christ uh, ascribed his return. All of it was to occur within that first century generation, and that was uh, that is what the Bible teaches, 
And that is what the apostles understood because it's what the Lord had taught them and what had been inspired by the Holy Spirit. Well, that is a summary of what we talked about tonight. Go back and listen to the broadcast. It'll be archived within about 15 minutes if you didn't hear the whole thing. And share this broadcast with your friends. Uh, Get the link, share it with them, post it on your Facebook pages, on your social media pages, and let everyone know about it. And uh, we'll look forward to being back with you on next week. So I'm William Bell uh, with Two Guys in a Bible saying to you, have a good night and God bless. Thank Thank you for for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Don Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time. We'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.